is, which are the tools that organizations and people need to develop good cybersecurity and privacy hygiene. So without further ado, let me introduce James Stanger from uh, CompTIA to talk about uh, what CompTIA does in terms of certification. And then that will be followed by a presentation from Omar Tene from IAPP, which is the organization responsible for individual privacy certification. So James, please. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, on behalf of CompTIA, I want to thank, uh, uh, thank you for uh, uh, bringing us out and also AIPP. I've got a slide deck here, but feel free if anybody has any questions at all, uh, feel free to stop me or what have you. Let me see if I can actually get this thing going here. All right. Is that F5? F1, 2, 3, 4. Oh, hold on. This is where I have to put on my glasses here. Look at that. Who knew? All right. So our agenda today, folks, can you hear me? Yeah. All right, great. Our agenda, folks, here, we'll be talking about some cyber case studies. We'll be defining the challenge about what is happening in terms of uh, security today, the best practices and that sort of thing. Then we have basically a discussion of CompTIA certs and AI, um, uh, IAPP certs. So I'm very uh, pleased to be here. James Stanger, I'm the Senior Director of Products. Has anybody here ever even heard of CompTIA or A+, or anything like that? If you have, it's my job to determine the strategy for those things. Uh, if there's a plus after it, I'm responsible for it. So if you, if you like it, uh, it's, 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 you know, come talk to me. If you don't like it, come talk to Joe Payden over here at CompTIA or Matt Starr over here at CompTIA. Uh, they'll talk to you. Um, I'm also here with uh, Omer. Omer, st stand up here uh, real quick. Uh, and Alyssa uh, from the IAPP, uh, they do a tremendous amount of work in terms of, of privacy. CompTIA does a tremendous amount of things, from education to philanthropy to advocacy, and then certification as well. Uh, uh, when it comes to the IAPP, they'll tell you more about it uh, in, in their presentation. But uh, 24,000 members, they have certifications, and it's an uh, honor to be here with them. So let's set the frame with some case studies here. Storage. Who has a uh, hard disk? Just kidding. Everybody has them, right? Uh, Western Digital probably makes most of them. You have Seagate. You have Toshiba makes them. You know, it used to be storage companies focused on what? Well, storage, hard disks, or what have you. But nowadays, guess what hard disks can do? They can communicate. They can communicate information. So not only can they take information, store it, do all the fun things that they're supposed to do, but now they can take that information and start drilling it in to the organization that created it. My point is, I was talking to some folks uh, in the storage industry, and we all know the Google model, right? You do a Google search, right? And they take that search that you made, and they marry it with you and your profile and your understanding, and they get tremendous amounts of information from that. They can sell that information. They can create marketing campaigns around that information. This is why the CEO of Google can say, look, we know you better than you know yourself in terms of your performance. What does that have to do with hard disks? Imagine this. Imagine this. How many hard disks do you have in your pocket right now? You have at least one probably in your mobile phone, right? There's your notebook computer, your desktop computer. All those have storage devices. Now, Google relies upon you to go and type in that search string, right? And then press enter. And then they can capture that information from you. They also send out those little uh, cars, right? Street view and all that stuff, collecting all sorts of information about us, et cetera, while providing a service. This is great. But imagine hard disk providers. They don't even have to have you go to their website, you know, to Western Digital's or Seagate's or Toshiba's website, because they have the information on your hard disk, right? And if that hard disk has the ability to do communication, right, imagine how they can gather information about you directly. Why would they have to do it any other way? Why would they have to wait and, and get it from Google? Let's talk about other uh, providers when it comes to internet service providers. They can do big data, too. Uh, whatever service provider you have, right? Just name it. I won't name any names. Uh, uh, I think their service providers are great, but they have the pipe. They provide the pipe into your house, right? They can make that pipe data aware as well. No need for the, you to go to Google or anywhere else. They can start collecting information about you, right? What are they doing with that information, okay, is the question, okay? So they can grab all sorts of metadata, whatever that is, 
okay, MAC addresses, the serial numbers on your phones, etc. right? They can grab that information and start profiling. I think about the Nielsen ratings. You guys have heard about the Nielsen ratings, right? They do great stuff. How many of you have ever had a Nielsen set-top box before uh, on your TV? You're kidding me. The first audience, three people? Yeah. I'm impressed. Yeah. Well, there we go. There we go. I have to sit down and talk about this. That's interesting. You know, that money that they get right, directly from the, the networks, right, NBC, ABC, CBS, I think last I heard was about 6% of their revenue. You know where they get most of their revenue from? From the information they derive from you. And then they sell that to marketing folks, okay? That's where they get most of their revenue from. The question becomes, once that information, that, excuse me, once that data has been turned into information, who's responsible for securing that? Who's responsible for making sure that information, and this is what I mean, there's raw data, right? And then it gets crunched. You can call it through big data, through Hadoop. You can call it through whatever MapReduce or whatever algorithm or whatever sort of study that is done. And it's turned into actionable information. How is that properly stored? There are a lot of players here that grab information. I've I've talked to people... uh, Bob Marlette from the state of Washington. He's a guy who's responsible for about 25,000 individual terminals for the police departments in the state of Washington. He interfaces with Interpol. He interfaces with federal agencies. He makes sure that the 25,000 terminals, whether they be in cop cars or cop cop mobile phones or whatever, all work together. He's responsible for making sure data is properly stored and secured, right? There are many other instances of people, of organizations, social security numbers, that sort of thing, where data is properly done. Who sets the standard for storing it, for sharing uh, sharing it? There's all sorts of discussions there. But the securing of it, that's really what we want to talk about. Because at CompTIA, we see that there's a major challenge here in regards to keeping things properly secure, right? So what's at stake? Well, there's primary and secondary information. So, or primary and secondary data, you could even say, right? When it comes to primary data, these are examples up here. Is that a laser? No. Um, When it comes to social social security numbers, credit card numbers, primary data, okay? Whenever there's a breach, you've noticed it, uh, you know, the ancient Target breach or the Sony breach or any of these other breaches that are going on all over, those are the things that you hear about, right? But when it comes to other information, there's GPS location information. How many of you use GPS stuff on your phone, right? I do all, I did to get here, okay? Um, Mac addresses, voice calls, all of that's metadata. That is turned then into, uh, that primary information and second, is turned into effectively secondary information because then you can start drawing conclusions. I know where her GPS location was, her MAC address was, and then I can start doing all sorts of things with it. Additional examples. I'm not saying you have to be afraid of the cookie monster, okay? I mean, I'm not a tinfoil hat person. But these are all, this is all data that is captured and collected in one way or the other. Serial numbers, ports used, times of connections, whenever you make a a phone connection. Uh, My favorite example is if some, if you could not listen to a data call, Okay, if you didn't, uh, law prohibited you from saying, I can't, you know, listen to James Stanger's voice call, right? But I can derive information from anything else made for that call. What could you learn? Case in point. Um, uh, we know that James went to a certain location. It's obviously, it was a medical building, right? And immediately after walking out of there, he made phone calls to his, his wife, his kids, his parents, his grandparents, to a pharmacy, to a bunch of other doctors, what would you be able to deduce or derive from that? You tell me. He's he's got something going on. He's contacting a lot of people. Why is that? Either really good information, really bad information. You can start to capture information just from this sort of thing. I don't even have to hear what James had to say on that phone. I can start to deduce things. Here's something that's a bit more practical. See that picture there? Right? That's my, uh, it's not a Jeep. Anybody know what that is? It's a Land Cruiser, Toyota Land Cruiser. It's as, about as old as I am. It's, it's a 1975 Toyota Land Cruiser with my kayak on top. Pretty cool stuff, right? Well, so what is, from that picture, can you tell what I like to do? 
ideas, right? Go on kayaking safaris or something like that, right? Any other information you, you can derive from that picture? I like antiques. I am. Are you kidding? Yes, I do like antiques, right? I like old stuff. Well, I could be a bit outdoorsy. You got an idea what my house looks like, right? Five-gallon propane tank. Maybe I like to go camping. You can start to draw all sorts of conclusions. If you were really savvy about it, what kind of trees are those? Maybe you can find out where he lives, right? But let's take a look at that picture. This is a, a, my Linux box, right? And what I did is I used an application called JHead. And what that does is that takes a look at the headers, the header information that's embedded within a JPEG device, right? Excuse me, a JPEG picture, right? You guys have all taken pictures, right? All of that gobbledygook there, guess what it learned? It learned that whoever took that picture used a Samsung device, certain resolution, et cetera. But here's the fun stuff. Do you see something interesting here? GPS coordinates. So my phone took those GPS coordinates, gave an address, even gave the weather. So now take a look at it each time you upload a picture and you have these things enabled, right? Information gets uploaded with it if you have it enabled, all right? Just saying, right, it's interesting that most smartphones can do this. They don't have to. Most of the times, those things are disabled by default. My point is, though, is that there's information that gets collected. And there are a lot of different models, a lot of different metaphors that people use, companies use. Uh, Cisco's used the idea of the fog. Uh, ARM uh, talks about uh, different devices. Uh, I like water collecting. In other words, water is starts dripping from your mobile phone, from home, industrial. It gets then captured in certain places and gets bigger and bigger until it goes into a data center. How is all of that data protected, right? So imagine the amount of data that gets pulled in here. It's very interesting. Now, we have privacy laws. We have techniques and tools all designed to do this. The question becomes, who determines those practices? If you have personally identifiable information, how do you go about getting it done? Well, security and your data. These are some of the things that we've been able to put together about some of the major attacks that have happened over the last year or so and some of the techniques. Social engineering. You guys know what that is, social engineering? Right? It's where somebody comes in and tricks you into giving information. They pretend that they're somebody or whatever. Zero-day attacks. That simply means that somebody, a bad guy, knows that there's a weakness in your software that you're using and is exploiting it before the good guys can fix it. Major problem. There's also malware that's installed in places. Here's something interesting. The technologies that are targeted, guess what the biggest problem is? I mean, it has to be, right? It's end user devices, it's weak passwords. You could say, oh yeah, it's those server administrators or those firewall people, oh, they do okay. It's the end users that's a major problem and missing patches. What do I mean by missing patches? Using old, non-updated software. Whether that be your phone or whether that be the server. And you could say, oh yeah, those server administrators, they never can get their act together or whatever. I don't want to land on end users or server administrators. Here's the key. I know a guy who said it took him his company about six months to do a simple upgrade of Java from one version to the next. Why? Because if he didn't do it slowly, he would basically be disabling hundreds of servers because those servers had custom programming on them. And if you do an upgrade of the server, excuse me, an upgrade of the server of the Java on there, it would break that custom programming. That's why patch levels are low. So, the biggies that seem to be happening right now are data at rest, data in motion, and end users. In other words, data at rest, it's being stored. How do you store it? Are you using full disk encryption, things like that? But also data in motion. As we all use our wireless devices, as we all are transferring data between servers or between the company and the cloud, right? how is that data being properly secured? Right? We have seen uh, hacking attacks change over the years, this kind of Darwinian kind of thing here. Back in 2000, remember all the email uh, viruses, right? Melissa and I love you and all that fun stuff. It's moved from that to spyware. It's moved to advanced persistent threats. That's what APTs mean. An advanced persistent threat is this. Um, uh, you've all heard of smash and grab robberies before, right? An advanced persistent threat is not a smash-and-grab robbery. 
Okay? Smash and grab, somebody grabs something and runs with it. Advanced persistent threat means somebody is living in your house and you don't know it. And they're ghosting along and you just don't quite realize it. And they're staying with you for weeks, days, weeks, months at a time, even longer. The increased attack surface is a big problem for tomorrow. By that I mean BYOD, the cloud, all these factors are bringing in many more ways in which systems can be attacked. And so another way to look at this is back in the day we were worried about viruses and worms and then botnets, right? Even now, sure. But it's that advanced persistent threat that we're mostly worried about, about people staying in your system. So how do you respond to those? Well, the general ways in which most uh, people will focus on things are hardware and software solutions. Firewalls, hardware, okay? Intrusion detection or antivirus and things like that. But what you're going to find, and I don't have a whole lot of time left, is wetware is what I think is the important thing. What do you guys think what I mean by wetware? What's in between a person's two ears, right? Your brain. Okay, that's what wetware is. That's the most important thing to focus on. So it's a question of controls. If you're going to secure that personally identifiable information, whether it be grabbed from a hard disk, as I was talking earlier, or through the internet pipe, or through Google, or any way, right, you generally have three ways of establishing controls. This concept of controls, folks, has been around a long time. ISO 27001, the British standards that started in the 90s, have all talked about controls. And those controls can be firewalls. Those controls can be patching your systems. Those controls can be teaching your wetware, teaching your people, right? And that, that to me, wetware is where it's at for me. But the idea is that in general, you have controls that are things like security and privacy policies. For businesses, you have subject, uh, sorry, service level agreements. So people in security not only need to be that tech, uh, scruffy looking person, they also need to be a person who can understand business terms, okay? Can understand what a, ser- what a service level agreement even is. You know, in other words, when that 3 a.m. call comes in the morning, right? Who takes it? What happens? What are those processes? Personnel-based controls to me are very important. At CompTIA, we do things like the CompTIA certified team. Basically, do you have team members of people who are certified and who have been trained? We also have security trust marks. We also have CompTIA certifications that we offer that are based on what the industry requires. APP does the exact same thing. So the whole idea is that you focus on team and company-wide training and team and company-wide standards. So you ha- so as you hold incident response drills, that's one of the latest things that's coming in nowadays, you basically can make sure that your team is acting as the industry wants you to act. Because when an organization like the IAPP or the uh, CompTIA puts together a certification, we, lo- we listen very carefully to what industry has to say. So best practices. We adopt, um, uh, there are basically a lot of organizations will use things like the old 8570 or now the new 8140 uh, mandate to make sure that individuals are following proper standards and certifications, that they're being trained. There are many great initiatives out there, uh, the NICE initiative, et cetera. The main key, though, folks, is to change your security model and your metaphor, to move from that wizard, that security wizard, to move from that lone gunman kind of Clint Eastwood type figure into something where you have a more collective approach. Now, we need experts, obviously, but those experts need to work together with the marketing people, with server administrators with middle management and upper management. And so the idea is that the expert is the person who is the quarterback or maybe the captain over the lieutenants or whatever metaphor you want to come about, but that person does not act in isolation. That's one of the main things that you're going to find in the security industry is that idea of cooperation and working with the collective. So as a part of that, you're going to see live fire kind of training and live fire kind of exercises and certifications. Why? Not only because you need to teach that scruffy wizard type person to be an even more scruffy or a wizard like person, but you need to make sure that you have trained people to work together as a team and as a collective to identify skills and gaps so that everybody understands what the threats are uh, in the systems to understand how they can focus on certain threats, that they can provide proper data analysis to identify exactly where that security breach is occurring. 
So at CompTIA, we have a skills roadmap. We have a lot of certifications. Uh, some of you have heard of A plus before, service desk and help desk people, right? That's what that's all about. IT help desk. But we also have things such as Server Plus, Linux Plus, Network Plus, and Cloud Plus. All of these things are designed to make sure that people are securing each element of the enterprise. So when it comes to uh, uh, security, we have security throughout all of our certifications. Things such as Security Plus, obviously, but also Network Plus, Server Plus, many of our other certifications have a large amount of certification involved because it's very important that teams work together. So uh, at this point, see, I had a half an hour, and I think it's 29 minutes after, so I did okay. At this point, I think it's time to uh, hand the time over or if there are any questions. Yes. Hello. Shout. Great. Shouting's good. Okay, so you made an interesting point about upgrade, and you used the word break. Now, yeah. Software, the Android system having, you know, uh, uh, vulnerabilities and uh, yes. less so in the Apple. So iOS you're talking world. about when I made that point about uh, that an upgrade can break things, and now you're asking about Android devices. Right. I and just so bring it in we, everybody. We've heard about these, you know, and of course yeah. we have Android phones, we have Apple phone, and I guess the iOS iOS is less so. So the manufacturer pushes out, or, or Android or Google, whoever pushes out some kind of patch because now they've a known vulnerability. Right. Right. All right. So my phone might be AT&T, it might be Verizon, it might be T-Mobile, and they don't get around to allowing me to patch that. That's right. So in your view, or whatever, in best practices view, mm -hmm. who's responsible for that? And in what is a reasonable period that I should expect my carrier to adopt that patch? In other Fantastic words, is it three question. months? Is it one month? Is it, is it two years? What's a reasonable time between a patch and when a carrier should push that uh, patch out? Well, because you've got the manufacturer of the phone, right? Yes. You've got the carrier. Right. You've got the individual who downloaded whatever app it might be, right? And then you have the CIO who allows all that in in the first place. So who's responsible? Somebody, right, if there's a break that comes in through the Android device or what have you, or through the Apple device, right, um, and the CIO brought it in, they're probably going to start coming after her or him, right, whoever the CIO is. And that, that's a major issue that CIOs have with, with the whole concept of bring your own device. So going directly to your question, right, so sometimes those updates are from your carrier, and by carrier, AT&T or Verizon no, or uh, no. whatever, sometimes it's the manufacturer, right? Samsung or, or HTC. Sometimes the manufacturer is the carrier, right? So who do you go after? I think the main issue here that, uh, and I can't answer who, I just don't know who exactly you go after. The real answer in, to this, and I'm not trying to be funky here, is uh, fragmentation is the thing to go after. In other words, you have, you have app developers, you have carriers, you have manufacturers, right? And not all of them work and play well particularly together. You throw in the end user, you have massive fragmentation. This is why um, uh, mobile phone uh, folks really worry about fragmentation in the market. And the answer, uh, uh, Apple would say, well, we are not as fragmented because we are the manufacturer and we work closer with the carriers. Uh, the Android folks say, well, we, you know, they would beg to differ and say, well, actually, we have a more efficient model and now you have the debate. Um, what I would say from an end user perspective is you need to make sure that you are responsible for your own upgrade, right? You need to make sure that uh, you do upgrades as, as much as humanly possible. If you're the CIO, you need to lock down the applications and you need to lock down the operating system uh, and you need to lock down uh, those mobile devices as much as possible uh, because you can't, as a CIO, control how uh, those uh, that fragmentation, how those things are upgraded, updated or not. But you can control how those devices are used in your network. So that's where I would go. Okay, and just to be clear, I, I work for the Enforcement Bureau here. I would uh, not go after anybody. Good I wouldn't you. dream of it. <laughs> <laughs>
Could you elaborate a little bit more on that when you say lockdown? What do you what um, steps do you imagine or what steps should be undertaken? Great question. One of the first things that whenever I was able to use this uh, phone here was that I had to put down. Uh, you can't see it, but I have to enter a, a password each time I want to use this phone. And that means that when I lose it, and I'm sure I will one day very quickly, uh, I'm absent-minded, I lose it uh, in the airport as I'm going through the TSA. It's much more difficult then for somebody to pick up my phone and go, hmm, I've got all his contacts, all his emails, and all that. The, d- the drives are, were also encrypted. That's, what, that's kind of what I mean by locking down. So you can set those features at an enterprise level, excuse me, enterprise level for all your phones. Right, so that would be something that the C, what would the a CIO? That's right, right okay. at that level. Thank you. That's where I would say. Anyone else? Well, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, uh, well, let's see, are we? I see three people back here, maybe yeah. asking a question. <laughs> I, I have a Sam, Galaxy Samsung, oh, yeah. and there are, there are chips or data that's in phones that sure. you can. So I have a I have to I don't enter a password. However, I enter a, a swipe little you know yeah. mm-hmm. p- pattern. So if they were to find your phone and they take the chip out, would they be able then to be able to access your data they w- in another not, phone? They may not be able to access your data, but they'd certainly be able to know it was your phone. Uh, I see. Uh, here's a po- story. A bunch of Stanford graduates got a, 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 a GoPro camera, tied it to a, a phone, and sent it up, you know, up into space, basically, right? Uh, sent it up using a, a, a weather balloon, right? They lost it, right? Because it, it, it ended up falling to the ground 50 miles away from where they thought it would, and their coverage map for the carrier, they, they couldn't figure out where the, where the phone was, right? Two years later, somebody is hiking, they find the phone, right? Didn't know whose it was or you know what was this all about. Took it into a carrier because you know, the the name of the carrier was on the phone, mm-hmm. right? And they were able to use the the, um, the information on the chip, and they were able to use that. And they called the per- the people up and said, "Hey, you guys missing a phone?" And they got all of these terrific uh, images of when they lifted this thing from a weather balloon up almost into space and then back down again. After two years, they thought it was lost. My point being that they can gather a tremendous amount of information about you. They'd know where it, wh- what you were doing and that sort of thing uh, with that phone. Thank you. But. Yes, sir. You mentioned uh, just a minute ago you have uh, put in a password to unlock your phone, and you also lock down the hard drive in your phone as well? You Is can. That... You can encrypt it. The huh? point being that um, uh, I don't want to get overly technical, but with this phone, right, mm-hmm. um, uh, if I didn't encrypt the drive, and even and, and let's say I didn't encrypt the drive at all, mm-hmm. and yet there was this pass password here, right? So it's like, oh, gosh, I'd have to figure out what James's password is. That's a pain. Well, you know what? If you were really technical, you'd say, let's see, that hard disk isn't encrypted, okay? It's not encrypted. That means that all I would have to do is install another operating system on this phone, and then all I'd have to do is mount that hard disk, and I could get to that information. I wouldn't have to know any passwords. Mm-hmm. Very easy. That's called, back in the old days, it was called super zapping. But the, in other words, you could put another boot image on this phone, and access all of that data and bypass any security that I had put in, wow. a, in a, as an end user. So what you do as a CIO or what you do at a, at a policy level is you encrypt this drive so that when it gets lost, somebody tries to do that trick of installing one operating, operating system on another or, or to map to it, they just get a bunch of gobbledygook because the drive is encrypted. But I assume we can't do that as consumers. What you, the yes, you drive. can. We can't? Yes, oh. you can. Yes, sir. Uh, you do it as an as an individual, right? Which mm-hmm. means that it would be encrypted unto yourself. Mm-hmm. Your CIO might be a little interested as to now why can I access that information on the on a company phone, right? So I'm not right. advocating that you break company security policies. But mm-hmm. as an individual, if you have your own phone, Personal, yes, yeah. you can do that. Okay. Yeah. How do you encrypt it? Well, we could do a seminar on that. That'd be kind of fun. Uh, but uh, basically, there's software that will do it. Uh, be careful you use the right stuff. And understanding some of that encryption is a little weak. It can be. So if you want to do it the right way, make sure that you're using something. You know, Just do a little bit of Google research on whatever app store or whatever app you want to use, and you'll find that they're high-quality ones versus low. I don't mean thank to take uh, more, too much time here or anything. That's great. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you very much, everybody. Happy to answer any questions. It'll- well, now that was great, and our next uh, presenter is Omer Tene, and he's from the International Association of Privacy Professionals. He's also the, their vice president of research and education. 
Welcome. Thank you. Let me just switch over. So thanks for inviting us. We appreciate the opportunity to speak here. And thank you, James, for the first presentation. And I want to also introduce Alyssa Rosensky, who's here uh, with me from the IPP. Uh, Alyssa is our director of uh, business development. Um, so uh, just to say a few words about the IAPP, the International Association of Privacy Professionals, uh, we are a non-profit, non-advocacy organization, so we don't advocate uh, any policies. Uh, we have a large membership, so it is a membership organization. We have more than 24,000 members uh, all over the world. Uh, initially started in the U.S., but actually expanding now more rapidly outside the U.S., uh, we do privacy training and certification, and I'll tell you a bit more about the certification programs, the certification schemes, which were accredited by ISO ANSI under a certification for certifications this past summer. Uh, I'll talk a, a bit about that uh, at the end of my presentation, and we also do training uh, initially for privacy teams privacy programs, privacy officers, but increasingly we see demand in the marketplace, uh, companies putting uh, hundreds or even thousands of their employees through training uh, to understand what sound data governance uh, measures are. Uh, we have all kinds of resources and publications for our members. Uh, some of you might actually know our daily dashboard, which goes out to 30,000 individuals uh, uh, every day. We have blogs. Uh, we have a research center, which I head. Uh, the Western Research Center, and we do conferences. Um, the big uh, uh, conference in D.C. is the IPP Summit, which uh, some of you might have attended or even spoken in. Uh, it's uh, in, usually in March this year. It's going to be in April, and we have more than 3,000 people attend that. We have big conferences in Europe and also in Asia now. And also uh, networking events, we have what are called uh, the knowledge net. So these are local chapters run by volunteers. Uh, we currently have them in 150 cities all over the world, and they meet periodically to do uh, fun privacy stuff. Um, so I, I want to talk a bit about what is the privacy professional uh, but, you know, whenever I try to explain what a privacy professional is, some people ask, but what is privacy? Uh, because privacy, uh, you know, it shouldn't be conflated with security as it often is. It's not one and the same as data security. Uh, data security is part of privacy, but privacy has different aspects. Security is about access and authorization and permissions. And it's usually a binary. It's authorized or not authorized, or authorized for certain purposes and not for others. Privacy sets the policy for data use, which may be implemented partially by data security measures, but it also talks about which purposes data can be used for, uh, whether individuals need to be informed, what are their rights, whether they have to provide consent to different uses. Uh, so privacy is broader than just uh, data security. And, um, you know, needless to say, almost it's, it's not a binary. It's not that you have or not have privacy. It's much more of a spectrum, and it's a, it's a softer uh, concept. 
Um, to, I, I wanted to give a couple of examples of um, stories of, or cases that played out, uh, enforcement cases or just in the press, which deal with privacy and not data security, just to kind of, you know, uh, uh, focus on the differences between the two concepts. Uh, so, of course, you've all heard and maybe even dealt with some of the major data breaches. The FCC pursued an uh, enforcement action against AT&T and for, for a big data breach. Uh, and data breaches are an aspect of data security. Sometimes they have privacy implications, you know, the Ashley Madison case or the, uh, uh, the big uh, U.S. Uh, government uh, uh, personnel management breach. Uh, a lot of data is out there, so individuals' privacy may be affected, but at the core, they are data security uh, uh, issues. Um, but there are other cases which actually deal with uh, privacy and not security, and one of them was uh, um, addressed by the uh, FCC, so Verizon's use of so-called super cookies, so code that was uh, injected into URLs in order for uh, um, other companies uh, to be able to identify a, an individual user, not necessarily by their name or their address, but just to know that it's a specific user who's uh, uh, clicking through different uh, websites. Um, so, so uh, you know, this case had nothing to do with data security. It's not that there was a data breach that information was lost, but the use by Verizon of individuals' data uh, for those purposes, uh, in this case, ad targeting, uh, raised some concerns. Individuals thought they need to be notified or maybe should have the ability to consent or to opt out. Uh, and eventually, in this case, uh, Verizon did uh, provide an opt out. Um, uh, another example, which was not an FCC but was an FTC case, uh, is the case of the flashlight app. Uh, so James just showed us that the metadata that's imposed on a uh, photograph includes location. Uh, what many people didn't know is that when they use their flashlight app, so it's this app that all of us have, I think, on our phone, and it turns the phone into a nice flashlight. It's kind of neat. Uh, also collected the location of the user and share the location also with uh, other uh, third parties. Um, so again, there was no breach. This was how the app was designed and consumers, you know, are taken aback and thought it's a breach of their privacy because individuals, uh, privacy is very contextual and it's tied to consumer expectations. And while you might expect an app like Uber or Google Maps to know your location, that is the purpose of the app. You want the, uh, you know, the car to uh, pick you up at a specific uh, 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 a geographical point. Uh, you might not have expected that the flashlight which you're using is also tracking your uh, location. So this is, uh, I think, another good, good example of a privacy case which doesn't have anything to do with uh, security. Uh, another story which actually goes back a few years, although the technology is kind of um, uh, surfaced again, is the use by ISPs of deep packet inspection. Uh, and James, I think you kind of hinted towards this when you said that the main pipe, uh, whatever it is you're using, if it's Comcast or AT&T, uh, is actually able to actually track the uh, um, consumption of uh, data and to make analysis and to monetize it. And in a way, you know, you can see the argument of some of these companies which are seeing the over-the-top providers, the Googles and the Facebooks, uh, dealing with individuals and informations, uh, information, and they think, oh, we also have enough, uh, a lot of information. Why don't we uh, make good use of it? So this was a few years ago. So uh, it was a collaboration between Charter, I think, uh, uh, and uh, uh, a DPI company called Nebuad. Uh, they, I, I think they went out of business. It didn't kind of bode well for their uh, um, business model. But we know that the technology is reemerging. I think on an opt-in basis, uh, some of the providers 
uh, give this service uh, right now. And again, it's a privacy story. It's not a data security story. It didn't involve any breach. This is what the technology was designed for. It was designed to track individuals' use of uh, the internet for advertising uh, purposes. Uh, and just another uh, example which kind of played out in the press over the past few months was uh, the Facebook um, emotional contagion experiment. So this was an experiment that Facebook uh, actually ran without uh, informing or uh, obtaining consent from its users. Uh, so 700,000 users, which I guess is a small number in Facebook terms, but you know, it's a sizable population were shown certain content in their newsfeed where the, uh, uh, um, the research project was to test whether if they show you like more positive posts, so happy stuff, you'll become happier than average or actually uh, maybe angry and resentful that people have such a great life and you know, yours maybe isn't. So the, the result is actually that people, there is a positive co uh, correlation. So there is some contagion. If you see positive stuff, you react positively and uh, vice versa, if you're, <laughs> if you're curious. But, but uh, uh, this raised a big public uproar and concerns and Facebook actually established uh, something resembling an IRB, an uh, Institutional Review Board, to kind of do uh, an ethical analysis of future uh, research uh, projects. But you can see that this has nothing to do with se security. The data wasn't lost. It wasn't breached. It didn't appear anywhere it shouldn't have. The, this was actually published. The research was published in an academic paper in a very reputable publication, but it did raise privacy concerns because the people thought, wait, well, you know, there are kind of meddling with our news feed. It's sacred. Um, so that's what privacy is about. Um, having discussed that, I want to tell you a little bit about the privacy profession and what are privacy professionals, because we're the uh, International Association of Privacy uh, uh, professionals. So the data I'm going to show now comes from a survey. So this is one of our research projects at the IPP that we conducted with EY over the past couple of months. And it's a survey, and we're going to issue a report. It's not out yet, so you're actually, you might be the first people who are, are exposed to uh, uh, this data. Um, uh, we surveyed our entire membership, so it's more than 20,000 people, and we had uh, approximately 1,000 respondents, so a sizable uh, um, uh, group sample. Uh, and uh, these are some of the lessons that we see. This is a report which is more than 100 pages long, so there's a lot in there, but uh, I'm giving you some uh, kind of nice nuggets. Uh, so who are the privacy professionals? So first of all, you can see their level in the company. You can see that the uh, manager or director level uh, uh, kind of figures as the uh, majority or almost majority. But you see that some of them are actually C-suite. You've heard about the CPOs, the chief privacy officers or the lead counsel. Um, and you can see their annual income there. I remind you, these are not uh, primarily government employees. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so um, uh, this slide uh, shows how the rank of the chief privacy officer compares to the rank of the chief in information security officer, the CISO. Uh, so of course, uh, the security officer is a much longer established role. There were security officers long before, you know, companies understood or started to manage privacy. Uh, but, you, but you can see that increasingly, so my, actually the large plurality here, 40% of respondents, say that now it's an equivalent level position. So the CISO, that's a pretty senior position in a company and the uh, chief uh, privacy officer, and sometimes privacy is even more senior. That This doesn't add up to 100 because some people didn't have uh, one or the other. Um, in terms of the influence of the privacy officers on their companies, you see that 
they feel that their level of influence is growing, and this, I think, uh, comes out very clear here. Uh, so almost a majority of the respondents feel they have some or a great deal of influence over the planning and implementation and design of new products in their companies, and uh, the trajectory is clearly uh, that of growth. Uh, this slide shows you some uh, uh, data points about privacy programs, and uh, uh, the columns represent different size entities, different size businesses. So you can see on the right, these are large businesses which have 25,000 or more employees, uh, and you know there's a middle category and a small business category. And you see that the investment in privacy programs, and again, this is completely distinct from the data security programs, you know, whose budgets are still much more sizable, but you can see that this is becoming uh, an important investment for companies. The average spend is a million dollars for uh, what we define as large companies. And you see that the uh, programs are expected to to grow, uh, so this uh, represents 24 professionals on average for these companies, and 41% expect uh, staff will increase next year. Uh, and also that they're becoming more strategic. So while for small companies they're focused on compliance, on regulatory compliance, the larger companies focus more on risk mitigation and on strategy. Um, this shows some differences by industry type, and I think it's an interesting um, it's an interesting slide because it shows you that uh, actually unregulated businesses, so these would be businesses from uh, industry sectors like marketing or online. Uh, compared to regulated uh, businesses, which are uh, mainly financial, healthcare, telcos, uh, you see that unregulated businesses actually spend more uh, on privacy and have greater resources, including staff devoted to privacy. So interestingly, privacy is something that has arisen from a business need from a realization on the part of businesses that data governance and meeting consumer expectations it has great strategic value and sometimes a great impact on their brand and reputation, and therefore they need to invest resources to handle it and to do it right, regardless of if they're regulated or not. So it's not regulation and regulatory compliance that drives privacy. Rather, it's the business need and uh, uh, you know imperative to meet consumer expectations. Uh, this is another slide which kind of shows the same thing. Uh, so here again, the columns represent unregulated uh, industries, regulated industries, and government. And you can see the main reasons that people uh, uh, state drive their privacy programs. And you can see that the, uh, um, uh, there are actually many more rows in this uh, uh, table. Uh, some of them talk about regulatory compliance. Uh, but you see that the more strategic uh, rows talking about enhancing brand and public trust or consumer expectations or the expectations of business uh, clients or uh, uh, entering into new global markets, you see that for those, we get the highest uh, uh, proportion of responses in the unregulated industries rather than regulated industries or uh, government. Um, so that's who privacy professionals are. Uh, as I promised, I, uh, I'll say a few words about our certification programs because I think they really spearhead our efforts to educate uh, individuals and uh, um, employees in different companies about how to do privacy right. Uh, so this past summer, we earned the ANSI ISO accreditation 
for our certification program. So oh, oh, ANSI ISO, I'm sure you know, are the uh, uh, American and international standard setting organizations, and they have a standard for certification programs. Uh, uh, these are the uh, acronyms for our different certifications. So we have a CIPP, which is a Certified Information Privacy Professional. It has a regulatory focus, and it also has different flavors. There's a US version, a Europe version, uh, uh, Canada, and government. We have the CIPM, which is a Certified Information Privacy Manager. Uh, it talks about how to integrate privacy into management. It's not necessarily a regulatory issue. It's uh, data governance. It's managing uh, privacy in the organization. And we have the CIPT, uh, the inevitable link to technology. It's the Certified Information Privacy Technologist. And needless to say, this uh, area, like uh, um, uh, our colleagues here, is very tightly linked to new technologies. Um, so, uh, in order to gain uh, uh, accreditation under this standard for certification schemes, you need to show these things. You need to show the, demonstrate the reliability of exams, which uh, uh, so they do psychometric analysis to see that the uh, questions are done properly, and that also the questions reflect the body of knowledge that you're testing against, so that, it, that they can actually distinguish between qualified and unqualified uh, individuals. Uh, impartiality is the hallmark of uh, the standard, just uh, to make sure that uh, there is no internal or external influence on uh, who gets uh, certified. Timeliness uh, uh, is connected to the fact that uh, both the regulatory framework and the technologies are evolving so rapidly. So you might know that we're in the midst of like a massive reform of the European privacy framework with the uh, coming of the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation. This is something that we are watching closely and will certainly have to uh, adapt our exams for, and uh, in fact, our entire body of knowledge. Uh, and not only the regulation, but also the technology is shifting very you know, rapidly. So things that we taught a couple of years ago have become like uh, last year's news now. Um, job relevance, you have to demonstrate uh, with uh, what's called the job task analysis that uh, the body of knowledge actually fits and determines what an individual working in this job is doing and should be doing. Uh, um, so, so we are actually testing against practical uh, questions and issues. Um, so in, in addition to those uh, requirements and procedures, uh, we uh, have uh, additional benefits at the IPP. So we have uh, the peerless subject matter experts we on our advisory boards and the, the people who actually write the body of knowledge and the uh, exams are you know, the most uh, experienced and senior privacy professionals in the field. We have the organizational support, so some certification bodies uh, actually use external resources. We have a lot of internal resources. We have the research center, we have training, we have publications to actually help steer uh, the certification uh, um, program. Uh, we have an international focus. As I, uh, uh, focus, as I said, uh, our, a large portion of our membership is uh, international, and we have specific designations in the cer certification program for uh, Europe, for Canada, and are actually developing uh, something in Asia now. Uh, and rapid growth. I mean, the, the growth of this industry is just uh, tremendous. It, it took uh, the IPP almost 10 years or 10 years to get its first 10,000 members uh, and less than two years to get the next 10,000 members. And we just see, you know, as the importance and relevance of this issue is growing uh, for businesses, so does the um, uh, population that seeks to connect to our um, programs and activities and resources. Uh, so that's it for me. And if you have any questions about privacy professionals or privacy, I'm happy to try to answer.
thanks. That was thanks for the presentation, uh, Omer. Um, d during James' presentation, he talked about security being a kind of collective effort. In terms of an IIPP certification, how does that interplay in an organization? Is there like one person who's the chief privacy officer? Um, and that's the person who's certified, or is there a recommendation in terms of best practices that other people with touch points with data should have a privacy certification? What, what, what's your, the, the world view of a, an organization and the people in the organization that deal with privacy-related data? Yeah, that's thanks for that because it's something we're actually thinking hard about, uh, uh, and you know it's a big issue for us now. Uh, so, so I think you know we see this um, the need trickle down. It started off as one person doing privacy, maybe even off the side of her desk as like a part-time thing. Increasingly, we see programs, you know, as the data here has shown, of uh, 20 or more people who are doing privacy in some organizations, some big companies have hundreds actually ingrained into different teams, into the product teams and the engineering teams and marketing and, you know, and HR and finance and everywhere in the organization. I think uh, typically, initially, you see the privacy team get privacy certification, but as I mentioned earlier, we're seeing a much greater demand for training, which might not reach the level of uh, actually getting folks certified, but companies want to have their employees and basically not just the privacy team, but anyone who touches and handles personal data. So it can be anywhere from a customer service representative, you know, to the head of HR, who's not a privacy professional, but does have a lot of data, uh, getting trained in order to understand what personal data is, what the identification or anonymization is, and what are some of the principles and rules for what should or should not be done with personal data. So I think certification has definitely expanded, and we see this in the numbers. We now have more than 10,000 people certified, and I think uh, people whose, you know, I'll say a big part of their job is privacy should definitely, you know, I think you don't want to go to, uh, you know, to have your teeth uh, uh, operated on by someone who's not a certified dentist. I think it's a similar situation here. You want someone who can demonstrate that they actually know the body of knowledge. Beyond that, I think it's uh, privacy training. Any more? I found it curious since regulated entities compete in the same market as unregulated entities and your data shows that regulated entities are less inclined or I mean your, your result was that unregulated entities implement more in the way of privacy than regulated entities. Any speculation as to why that might be true? Yeah, so oh, you know, that's, it's a good question. I, I, my speculation is that regulated entities at least start by treating this as a compliance matter. So it's regulatory compliance. They deal with it, you know, and it's, it's very clear from the data that it is dealt with and covered. But they deal with it as a compliance matter, so it will usually be the compliance team reporting through the uh, GC maybe or through the chief compliance officer. And, you know, some of these companies have a very heavy regulatory burden. So, you know, if it's uh, not to speak about your <laughs> kind of constituents here, but banks, you know, they have a lot of regulatory issues to deal with, and this is one of them. Uh, I think for companies uh, whose business is data and data monetization, even if they're not regulated, they just figured that this is, you know, it's the heart of their business. It's their main strategic asset, so they invest in it appropriately. It's not a compliance matter. Thank you very much. A pleasure.
Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, I hope I, I, we focus on privacy enforcement, as you know, and I hope everybody got from this session today from both IAPP and from CompTIA that organizations have means by establishing and determining what best practices are in the area of both security and privacy. And I'd like to thank you very much for coming and, and helping us get smarter on this issue. That's been our effort for the last year. We've had a couple of these series, and this is just the perfect way to kind of cap the discussion of creating a good cyber and privacy ecosystem. So thank you very much.